Good afternoon, everyone. People could take their seats. So uh, we, we, we came into the break 15 minutes behind schedule. When we start this, we're going to be 10 minutes behind schedule. And if every speaker is cuts off five minutes, we're eventually going to end up ahead of schedule. OK, uh -huh. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But um, <laughs> anyway, I'm very, very happy to be able to preside over this session in honor of uh, Tony Leggett. Um, I'm afraid I couldn't be here for the morning session. I was on travel, but I, I just want to tell one quick story. When I first came here and I was interviewing, I was at a, a rather scary dinner with Tony Leggett and Gordon Bame and uh, David Campbell at, uh, I think it was Tony Leggett's house, actually. And I did the smartest thing I've ever done, which is I said almost nothing uh, to not reveal my inadequacy to be sitting in that room with those three people. So uh, I'm really glad to still uh, be accepted as part of this community. And I'm particularly glad to be able to introduce Irfan Siddiqui from Berkeley, uh, telling us about the dawn of quantum processors. Okay. Can everyone hear me in the back? <laughs> Let me start by first wishing Tony a very happy birthday, right? <laughs> to thank you and the organizers for giving me a chance to speak at this really beautiful and momentous event. My memories of Tony are maybe similar to what Paul said, of trying to absorb all the wisdom that came. And the last time I was here, we talked about microscopic uh, effects and quantum mechanics, and I'm still thinking about the questions you've asked. Right? And today we will still talk about this question of macroscopic events or effects in quantum mechanics. In particular, Nandini told us about the very good and sharp questions that Tony asks. As an experimentalist, I would like to add that he has very hard questions also. But they have the ability to inspire quantum mechanics to try to drill a hole into this theory and try to understand what really makes this world tick. And in particular, it's very exciting at the moment to think about the experimental progress that we have in this field. And many have dubbed this particular era as the second quantum revolution. And indeed, if we pay homage to revolutions. We can think of quantum mechanics starting with a revolution where one realized that the world is granular. Right? And in fact, there are many questions that came after that. Spooky action at a distance, limits to entanglement, so on and so forth. And we are at this very exciting time where, in fact, the world can be entangled at some level on demand. And this is raising many, many interesting questions. In particular, the ultimate question is the entire universe entangled. And that's really where I want to end up at the end of this talk, thinking about high energy physics and entanglement and how one looks at that through the tools of quantum mechanics. So the story starts here. It's really a quantum mechanics through the eyes of a squid. And it is not, of course, the mollusk that I'm thinking about, although there may be some quantum effects in biology which we're thinking about. But really, it's the circuit that I'm thinking about where one imagines having a tunnel junction, things that are of order microns in size, if not bigger, millimeters in size. And one asks the question, typically in our quantum classes, we teach the formalism based on atoms and photons. But is this object really the same as the one on the right? And in fact, the two questions I want to address in this talk, or at least show you some experiments on, are how quantum are electrical circuits, really? You know, what tests can we do, in fact, to see the underlying nature of quantum mechanics in these systems? And the short answer is, the, the closer we look, we still see quantum mechanics, okay. or something that's consistent with quantum mechanics. The second question is then, how does one test macroscopic quantum coherence? And what does it mean to be macroscopic? And that's another question that I will try to come to in the second half of the talk. So, a good friend and colleague and a friend of yours, John Clark, who is not able to be here today with us, very much sends his regards. And I brought from John two slides that I wanted to start off with. In this first slide, John says, in the beginning, right? And in particular, he's referring to this presentation at this very famous LT meeting, where in fact, the possibility was brought up of looking at this promising candidate of a squid for looking at macroscopic effects. In particular, one can think about tunneling in such systems. And in fact, the possibility to display macroscopic quantum effects should in fact give us some interesting sidelights on the quantum theory of measurement. And indeed, John went on with his group to do this very seminal set of experiments 
where one indeed showed that the Josephson junction could be quantized. So indeed, we had a bona fide quantized system, but was it quantum coherent? And what does it mean to be quantum coherent? This question took some more years to investigate. And the reason for this difficulty, perhaps, is summarized in this slide in that both atoms and engineered atoms through superconducting circuits are indeed quantum objects, <clears throat> but in fact, they are rather complementary in the way they interact with the complex environment. So one can imagine having a complicated environment made up of photons, of phonons, of magnons, or what have you. The native coupling of atomic systems, for example, as shown here in an atomic lattice, is weak whereas in fact the native coupling of circuits is quite strong. And what that leads to is that the nature of this strength changes very much the time it takes for quantum effects to decohere. In particular, the energy relaxation time of a neutral atom can be of order seconds, reflecting this weak coupling. A superconducting circuit with no tricks played in 99 lived only for about a nanosecond. Okay. And nowadays, with some better electromagnetic engineering, we're well beyond 100 microseconds in such systems. The second challenge in these engineered atoms is that their transitions are in the microwave frequency. So it's quite difficult to measure a single microwave photon with very high efficiency. So the basic circuit I'm going to talk about in the rest of the presentation is just an LC oscillator. This is a circuit that's made with the Joseph's Tunnel Junction here, Josephson Tunnel Junction, shunted with a capacitor. And indeed, as we know, the potential energy surface is a cosine of such a structure. And in fact, the simple version of a superconducting qubit is a particle in a cosine box. That's actually all what we're looking at. With the right choice of parameters, there would be of order three or four or perhaps five levels in such a box. Okay. And in particular, here's a zoom in of the size of junction that will give you that five level structure there. Okay. The utility of these engineered atoms is that one can tune their frequency. The circuit as shown is only weakly enharmonic, so there's only a 5% change in their enharmonicity. But nonetheless, it becomes a very, very simple structure to try to engineer into a complex quantum system. As I mentioned, this circuit, as shown, would couple very strongly to an open environment. It would decohere almost immediately on the scale of nanoseconds, if not faster. So another enabling trick of our field was to borrow solidly from atomic physics and place such circuits, for example, in a cavity. And the utility of this cavity would be to change the coupling to the outside environment. It would limit the modes that interact with the circuit and of course also give you a way to measure the actual quantum object inside. So what do we actually measure? What is quantum? Or what is the quantum state that one is measuring in such a circuit? Here is the cavity shown here. Here is the circuit. It almost looks like a very simple dipole. And that's because it is a very simple dipole with two ears on it. And it couples to the cavity field which can be probed by a microwave input. So here is the re response in the microwave regime that one would see in the reflected signal. And in particular, all the information will be encoded in a phase shift. This is an oscillator. Its inductance will change depending on the state of the qubit. And you will see that as a phase shift of the probe field. Okay. And in particular, the microwave field, which is reflected as an in-phase and quadrature phase component, making linkage to my optics colleagues, one goes ahead and makes a homodyne measurement of these quadratures and extracts the qubit state. So this is the mapping. The voltage that we measure is a proxy for the quantum state of the circuit inside. Now, measuring this voltage, however, is not a trivial task by any means. Okay. In particular, a strong measurement of the system is made when there's a single microwave photon interrogating the cavity. So if we would like to make a very high fidelity measurement, we need to resolve a single microwave photon extremely well. And as I'll show you a little bit later in the talk, if we actually want to measure the dynamics of this quantum system, we need to resolve much better than a single microwave photon on average. This is done in our lab using amplifiers that are also made of superconducting circuits. These are parametric amplifiers. And this is, I think, generation 14 or 15 
of this type of amplifier in our lab at the moment. And they have the utility of allowing us to make a very pure measurement of, of a microwave input signal. To show you the story of how quantum are these circuits, before these amplifiers, and before we were measuring as a community with very high precision, typically the best we could do was to measure the average population of the quantum state with time. Now that's not very convincing of a quantum effect, right? An exponential decay is, is ubiquitous in physics. That could simply be an oscillator, a classical oscillator losing its energy over a certain time period. But we all felt in our heart of hearts that this is truly quantum. And if it were, then really what we were seeing is, for example, a pi pulse exciting us to the excited state of this two-level system, and then a spontaneous decay happening sometime later. And if we averaged all of these decays together, we would get this exponential. We could just never see it. Until we started using these amplifiers, and in fact, these were the individual quantum jumps that we were now able to see in such a system. And in particular, not only could we very easily discriminate between, let's say, 0 and 1, we also had a very good idea of when the decay happened on a single shot basis. And in particular, we could histogram those decays, and that's what's shown here, and then reproduce the curve showing T1. So that told us that this is rather consistent with quantum mechanics if we start to now peer under the hood of what's really happening in these circuits. Then we actually ask the question, well, what about this jump? Is it instantaneous? Nothing in life is, is instantaneous. And in particular, in this cavity QED type of system, there is a continuous evolution of the information that comes out. So there is a trajectory which takes the quantum system from one state to another. And the question is, could we resolve these trajectories by simply continuously monitoring the qubit? This is even a harder task than the readout task because I can't integrate the signal. I really need to follow it with very high signal to noise. Here I could cheat. I simply integrated and decided whether it was above the line or below the line. It also introduced an interesting philosophical question. How does one convert voltage to quantum state? Here we cheated. It was just above or below and that's zero or one. And as it turns out, with many of these quantum effects, if you look deep under the hood, there's something classical actually going on, or something very similar to classical physics. So in this particular case, we used Bayesian updating, which is ubiquitously known in classical physics and statistics, to see if that would model the evolution of a quantum system. Okay. So the procedure was as follows. We would take strong projective measurements and think of them as really a sum of very weak continuous measurements. So you probe the system, you get a little bit of information, a little more, a little more, and finally you know enough to distinguish the state. We could slow that down, do a decent job with the efficiency, and then we up, use a Bayesian updating procedure to see if every little bit or partial bit of information that came out would actually allow us to reconstruct in some faithful way a quantum trajectory at the single trajectory level. So this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to take our circuit, put it in a superposition, just like a spin that's half up and half down, and probe it and find these individual trajectories as it goes to an eigenstate. So here's a movie of that particular updating procedure. One starts with a spin. Here, for example, it's a sigma z state. So this is the, these are the two eigenstates, which are here. And we start with a superposition in sigma x. And if we now use this Bayesian updating, this is, in fact, the, a single quantum trajectory of such a qubit. Seems kind of schizophrenic. It wants to end up here, but it goes down, then it goes up, and it goes down, and so on and so forth. So the question you should be asking is, does this mean anything, or is it completely rubbish, because there's no way to check right, if your quantum system was actually doing that. So the way we verify that this Bayesian updating is actually giving us our best guess at the system is to repeat this measurement many, many times, find all the trajectories point by point that go through this, and then actually do tomography at each one of those points. And that's what these little red points are. These are a tomogramic, tomographic reconstruction of a family of trajectories, telling us that this very, very classical method of analyzing statistical updates seems to work perfectly 
for a single qubit. It actually works exquisitely well also for recreating entanglement. So if you have two qubits and want to look at their entanglement developed, this works just fine for that also. On this topic, I want to mention actually something also, which is very radically different, I think, than the usual way we think about this. What about machine learning and artificial intelligence? After all, we can teach cars, right? We think we can teach cars to drive on the road. Can you teach a black box quantum mechanics? It turns out it works really well, actually. So in fact, we can imagine using a recurrent neural network, which is a black box, and you tell it, look, I have a quantum measurement, which is along some axis, and of course it's binary, and it has a certain result, which is also binary. And now what's very nice is that in this continuous measurement uh, modality, I can just update every little time step, and on a certain set of data, use it as training data, so that this apparatus can learn the rules of quantum mechanics without knowing the master equation, without knowing anything. And it turns out it actually reproduces these trajectories exquisitely well. Much faster, much easier than the standard differential equation approach. The reason I wanted to give that example is that information in quantum mechanics blows up very rapidly. For one qubit, I'm tracking the state, I fill up half my hard drives, literally, just to understand what's going on. And then I want to go to 10 qubits and 100 qubits and do error correction. This is an interesting idea. Perhaps this is a, a more intelligent way to sort of manage this data. The jury is still out on that. But that allows me to make this segue. Here is a plot of superconducting qubits showing the number of qubits and how long they live. Okay. And we lived in this little part for a long time. <laughs> one qubit, one microsecond. Few qubits, one microsecond. And this is sort of the phase where we were still trying to understand quantum mechanics. Is it really quantum? Can you measure it? <clears throat> what does feedback look like? What do errors look like? So on and so forth. But then the question is, okay, it seems to be quantum. You know, what can I do with this system? Or what can I do with maybe tens of them or hundreds of them? Well, if you want to use gates, the current state of the art is here. As I said, everyone in the field has somewhere between 10 and 100. And they live between 10 and 100 microseconds. So we moved up a few orders of magnitude. However, if one wants to realize a real fault-tolerant quantum computer with all the bells and whistles, that's kind of over here. And then all this white space is sort of very motivating for us to think about what other science could we do in there. In fact, there's a lot of interesting science questions. Right? How does coherence evolve with size? Can we maintain this level of coherence as the system gets truly bigger with independent degrees of freedom? And in fact, is there an advantage to quantum scaling? Is there some proof that a quantum machine will do better than a classical one, aside from the very few problems that we've talked about, in a practical sense? So pause with me on that one, I'll come back to that in a moment. So we tackle this problem of chemistry. This is a very near-term application of quantum technologies. And the idea here is, is basically the idea of storing a lot of information in quantum systems. Right? Each bit can take many configurations, so on and so forth. If one actually tried to solve the Schrodinger equation with a classical computer for a reasonable number of atoms in something the chemists call FCI, or full configuration interaction, you run out of memory real fast right, in your computer. So in fact, even if you were, oops, even if you were to use a supercomputer with petabytes of memory, the maximum number of qubits in the absence of any symmetries would be of order 40 or 50 that one can simulate. We can build 50 qubits now. So it starts to get very interesting to see where this crossover is. Uh, I do want to pay homage, of course, to tensor network methods, clever theory things that push that boundary, but not by orders of magnitude. Right? It still becomes a, a very classically intractable problem fast, and there are approximation techniques such as DFT and so on and so forth, but the real goal of this quantum chemistry is to take the accuracy of this exact treatment but push it up very rapidly in the number of elements you can treat. So what problem to solve in quantum chemistry? So this is the holy grail of, of quantum chemists, or at least one of them. And the idea is to think about catalysis. In particular, the Haber process, which is used to make ammonia, the way humans do it, a la Fritz Haber, is to use 400 degrees centigrade temperature and 200 atmospheres pressure. Okay. 
Uh, this consumes 1% to 2% of all energy on the earth. Okay. And in particular, if you're a gardener, then your legumes do it just fine with nitrogen fixation at 25 degrees. And the, the thought is that there is a there's a catalyst, an iron molybdenum catalyst, and in particular, the, the dynamics and structure of this catalyst are really not tenable. By classical methods, the idea is that quantum mechanically you could get to that. So that's a, a very lofty goal. Right? We started off with a much simpler goal of trying to understand the hydrogen molecule, which is a lot simpler, but nonetheless illustrates the power of quantum. So the first theory question is how can you use qubits to look at fermionic systems? After all, qubits are distinguishable. Right? And they are not fermions, just like electrons. And one maps your operators in second quantization to poly operators that are descriptive of your qubits by using, let's say, a jordner wigner transform or something else of that flavor. And this allows you to write your Hamiltonian in terms of poly operators. You lose locality. Right? You have locality in your electron problem, but you don't have it anymore in the spin problem. But that's OK. We can run gates on different qubits at different times. The second question is, what's the algorithm? Right. How should I figure out, let's say, the energy using my quantum system? Okay. An approach which is very powerful these days is to use something called variational eigensolver or hybrid approach. In a nutshell, let me just explain what this means. One can imagine a quantum algorithm where you do everything on your quantum mach machine. You add numbers, you store them in the register, you divide, you factor, so on and so forth. There are only maybe one step which is hard, <laughs> classically. So it would be a lot easier just to do that one hard step quantum mechanically and do all the other steps classically. Chemistry is a problem that lends itself to that very easily. Let me illustrate. Here's my quantum state, psi. I put it under a certain Hamiltonian. I can write this Hamiltonian as a sum of correlators. Okay. So there's a one-body correlator that says this is the self-energy of each site. There's a two-body correlator which tells you the nearest, uh, the neighbor interaction, and so on and so forth. And the idea is that you're probably not going to use the 10th order correlator for the energy. You probably just need one or two of these terms. So by linearity, of course, I can find these correlators one at a time and add them together. I don't have to find them all at the same time, which makes the quantum problem really a lot simpler. Okay. This is easy on a quantum computer, finding these correlators. Adding and minimization is a lot easier on your classical computer. So the idea is to parameterize the quantum state with some classical parameters, compute the correlators using quantum mechanics, then minimize using a particle swarm or Nelder meet or whatever optimization tool you want. Okay, and that's what it looks like when you run the whole thing. You pre-compile coefficients. The steps here shown in yellow are the quantum steps. You calculate the correlator. You measure the correlator. And you keep iterating until you find energy minimum. If you do this, then you get the hydrogen spectrum. So this plot is computed using this quantum algorithm on a quantum processor. The solid lines are what you would compute in Mathematica in, in one second, right? to show you that, in fact, they match within chemical accuracy of what you wanted. So even though this is hydrogen, if we are able to do this on 50, you cannot do that in the life of the universe on your classical computer. So we're on our way, we hope, if this performance holds. So this is the idea of using quantum systems for calculation, computation, so on and so forth. And then I want to get to a problem which I know you have thought about for a long, long time, <laughs> which is, what about this dissipative environment? Right? All of the experiments I showed you try to maximize coherence, right? because your system is the qubit system. Everything in the outside world causes decoherence. But what if your qubit or arrangement of qubits, in fact, can model the environment? Right. So the first set of experiments I talked about, here's a qubit. It's embedded in all of these modes. Right. And if you want to write the Hamiltonian of your resistor, you told us how to do that right, in this famous paper of Caldera and Leggett, which shows an arrangement of, of oscillators or modes where information doesn't come back. But what's interesting is, if your environment is made up of many qubits, and all of them are unitary, then this information is not lost. Right. And the question is, in fact, if you spread information in a quantum system, can you unspread it? Right. Can lost information be recovered? Okay. 
And this question actually bears quite a lot of overlap with a question in high energy physics that Hawking, and it's quite timely, of course, given his passing, thought about. So first, let me pay thanks to my, one of our graduate students, Marie Lu, has, who has drawn all the black hole things that you'll see in the next few slides. The, the classic problem is you have a black hole, right? And black holes are black in the information sense because they scramble information. Right? You take a bit of information, you put it in a black hole, it gets shared amongst all its elements very rapidly. Okay. But Hawking also told us that black holes evaporate, right? they radiate, and one needs entanglement of these Hawking photons on the outside with the center to maintain the preservation of information. So the question is, if Alice takes this famous book of Alice in Wonderland and throws it in the black hole, can it be reconstructed by Bob or the rabbit on the other side in some sense? And how many Hawking photons do I need to measure? So let me recreate the experiment. Here's the black hole. I throw in a bit of information. You can try to measure the radiation which comes off of the black hole and try to reconstruct that state. Don Page told us that you'd have to measure about half of the photons coming off to reconstruct that state. That's an impossible problem. That's 10 to the 60 years for the black hole to evaporate that information. But John Preskill and Patrick Hayden asked a very, very interesting question. What if you took a black hole that had already evaporated half its information? Okay. So I'm in the black hole. David Campbell, you have half of the photons. And then Andrew throws in a state. Will you immediately know because we're entangled? And the answer is yes, you actually will. So this is a very interesting experiment. If you already have some of those photons, very rapidly you can check this. And the question is how to do the experiment. We can't do this with black holes. Right? But we can try to think about doing this with a unitary operator in our quantum processor, which will mimic scrambling. Right? So we have to describe what is the scrambling in a black hole right? and how one realizes that in a, in a quantum system. So I brought this up because in condensed matter physics, this has been known for a long time. Right? How do you take information and study out-of-time ordered correlators, such as the Lockschmidt echo, other co uh, chaos techniques, so on and so forth, to see how information is spread. Imagine that you have an arrangement of spins here, and you have a unitary operation which takes information which is only contained here, or correlations which are contained here, and spreads them someplace else. Okay. This is the classic chaos problem. If I make a small change here, will there be a very large change at the output? This is your butterfly effect. So the question is, if these trajectories, like the ones I showed you earlier, diverge for very small perturbations of the input, this is a chaotic system. In quantum language, you can calculate this correlator. You can make a measurement before and after and change the order and see how different are those results. Okay. So this has become very popular in the literature. These are out-of-time ordered correlators. The challenge is, how do you measure an out-of-time correlator that distinguishes between your scrambling unitary U and also the decoherence background that you have. That's a hard, hard, hard problem. But the nice proposal by Ben Yoshida and Norman Yao is to think about teleportation. That's really the experiment to be done. To try to teleport, really inspired by this high energy physics modality, through this unitary. And this is what the circuit would look like. You start off with an input state. This unitary operator would entangle you with an EPR pair. Right? And this EPR pair is your black hole in the Hawking radiation <laughs> that's there. That's what would scramble, and then you run U dagger to unscramble. And I wanted to include this slide because it was told to us that we should talk about a little bit of the past, but also the future. But in quantum mechanics, they are the same, right? They are just U and U dagger. <laughs> okay, so this is the, the operation of encoding and decoding that's there. One thing to note is that we do this with Q trits, three level systems. And that allows us to use bipartite interactions. That's a long discussion, but that simplifies the logic. So what does scrambling do? This is the density matrix of your Q-trit, right, with rows and columns representing one Q-trit and the other. This unitary operator is basically a swap. It basically takes information from individual states, say here, and spreads them over all the other ones. Okay, so that's how you would construct it. This is the chip that we run this on. This is more complicated than the one qubit in the cavity. These are eight qubits in a ring that are running about 70 microseconds. And in fact, this is already dated. We're closer to 100 now. Okay. To run this experiment, we had to invent the gates, because these are now ternary gates. They're not the standard two qubit gates. 
But here, for example, we're able to generate now a EPR pair in q -trits with 94% fidelity. So the only thing that's left now is to run the unitary and see if scrambling really happens in a system. Okay. This is what the simulated answer should be. If I have gates that are consisting of poly operators, poly operators can be on single qubits or pairs of qubits, or qtrits if you like. Local gates keep you within the one qubit manifold. Entangling gates generate entanglement right, over a certain target set of states. Scrambling does something that looks very, very different, right? It takes all the information out of the one qubit manifold or qtrit manifold and puts it all over the system. So that's what scrambling should do. And the question is, can you do that and can you reverse it? Right, to be determined. So that brings me to the end and some questions. Specialized quantum computers are here. We are able to do small things, thinking about how to expand them into more uh, perhaps practically useful things as time goes on. There are applications in many fields. I touched upon a few of them, but they're really fundamental questions. For example, how do we error correct in different architectures? In this model where you have a hybrid algorithm, half quantum, half classic, what does error correction look like? What does error mitigation look like? Can we use machine learning or the quantum version of machine learning, which is debated, to do something in this domain? And I want to get back to this idea of quantum advantage. You see, there is the quantum aspect that if you had a perfect quantum system, no errors, nothing ideal, it would be exponentially powerful. But then you have to correct for errors, which inevitably exist, and do other operations. And if you subtract the two, what are you left with? <laughs> right? And how does that scale with the size of your system? And indeed, we learned our lesson with Bell's inequality. No doubt Einstein was right questioning about entanglement over the cosmos, but if you want to use it, <laughs> And then there's some classical channels that are also needed. So if you put in the classical channels for your computation, what is actually left? So that's a very interesting fundamental problem. Moreover, on the very last thing that I talked about, there are different shades of information scrambling. In condensed matter physics or a completely disordered system, information is just gone. Right? In the black hole problem, nothing is gone. It's exactly there, you can reconstruct it, but all of physics is in between these two ends. And the question is, what other baths can we create and study with these techniques and try to engineer as we go forward? So that's the science end of it. And of course, I want to end with the bullets in red. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And that's absolutely right. This is why we're using spin one. And that's one of the points of using Q-trits and other things. Yes, in fact, there's many works about, in fact, how to put together, thank you for this, right? To also imagine to link that with thermodynamics, right? In fact, can one use uh, ideas in the Jarzinski inequality, so on and so forth? Will this actually be there? Will they diverge? How do you link them to other physical quantities? It's quite a rich system. And in fact, like I said, there's different shades of scrambling also. We can talk about Hamiltonian scramblers versus other scramblers, so it's a whole zoo to look there. So we are very much aware uh, of this prediction, but thank you for reminding us of that. Yes, uh, Tony was asking about the efficacy of bosonic sampling as a method to look at uh, various problems in chemistry, say, or, or otherwise. Uh, you continue to ask very difficult questions <laughs> that are there. 
the idea of either using boson sampling, and I think Ray Laflamme is here, maybe he has a better <laughs> answer than I do. This is something that is, continues to be debated, right? And I'm not an expert, I think, so I will play the fifth unless Ray wants to make a comment. <laughs> so that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> With very few words. This is, I think, the feeling of many, right? Uh, basically, in the field, there are also questions about annealing, right? Versus adiabatic mechanism. This is also again continues to be an evolving question. Uh, the link between, as you mentioned, you know, what happens in chaotic systems is very evidently known in annealing at the moment with Ite Hen, for example, and others at USC, really at least giving us the sense that as you try to solve more and more complicated problems, there are different quantum flavors of chaos that come in, right, that are uniquely quantum in some sense. Some of them bear classical signatures, but they basically make your pixel bigger in your annealer. And this is a very fundamental statement about, you know, if one can use this annealing and is there an advantage to it. So I think as time goes on, we're learning a little bit more about uh, as one goes beyond proof of principle experiments in this domain, uh, what really the advantage would be. <laughs> okay, let's uh, thank, thank you. Great, so I'm happy to introduce uh, Andrew Briggs uh, for our second presentation in this on Is Reality There When Nobody Looks? Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you, Afan. You'll find there's a lot of continuity between what you were telling us and uh, what I'm going to talk about. And the um, title is the reality. Maybe on or not on that? Let's see. Yeah, I think it's done. Yeah. Is that better? Can you hear me at the back? Wave your hand. Good. So the title is taken from a paper that was flashed up on the screen this morning, published in 1985, is the flux there, uh, when nobody looks, which itself is taken from uh, an anecdote that Abraham Pace recalls of uh, Einstein asking him a question about whether the moon is there when nobody looks. Tony says that he may have been telling this little girl about the moon. I wonder if he was telling her that it's there when nobody looks. Tony and I share uh, having uh, a humanities degree as well as a science degree. And uh, yesterday evening, I discovered that uh, he and I had both given, had each given lectures to um, humanities philosophers about Plato's Timaeus. And so I thought I would start motivating this by um, uh, a bit of a film that was released actually last Saturday, just in time for your 80th birthday, by Curiosity Stream, where an artist, Roger Wagner and I, uh, flew around the Mediterranean recording on location discussions about places where significant advances had taken place in Curiosity. And I'm going to show you a little clip where we're filming on location in Plato's Academy. And it starts off with Roger uh, introducing uh, that, and then you'll see when it comes to geometry, he hands over to me. The first person to take this idea forward was Plato, the pupil of Socrates. After his teacher's death, he left Athens and traveled in Italy, where he studied with the Pythagoreans 
who believed that number was the divine principle at the heart of the universe. And when he came back to Athens, he set up a sort of philosophical school here in a grove of trees called Hecademos, or the Academy. It's said that he put a, an inscription over the doorway saying, let no one enter without geometry. So over to you, Andrew. <laughs> one person who did enter and even had a banquet given in his name was an astronomer and mathematician named Eudoxus. Eudoxus is supposed to have arrived as an impoverished student, sleeping in a boat down in Piraeus and walking up each day to lectures. Apparently Plato had set astronomers the following problem. By the assumption of what uniform and orderly motions can the apparent motions of the planets be accounted for? Eudoxus worked out that if you assume that the planets move in uniform circles around the Earth, then you can produce a reasonably accurate mathematical account. The scheme that Eudoxus worked out was wrong, though it took 2,000 years to discover that, but the idea of using mathematics to describe the way the world works was absolutely right and has been central to science ever since. Well, um, we'll come back to uh, curiosity uh, at the end, but get a switch. Um, let me move on to the, the paper uh, that uh, I mentioned at the start. Uh, let me ask, uh, just raise a hand. I, I, in this paper, um, Tony is uh, describing with uh, Anupam Garg um, a macroscopic realism that can be set against um, quantum theory. How many people would feel comfortable summarizing the position of macroscopic realism that's set out in that paper? Raise a hand if you would. One. Okay. <laughs> Two. Three. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, in a couple of slides, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it for you. But there's a lovely footnote, uh, which is that uh, you have to exclude the genuine adherence of uh, one or two particular points of view the relative state and the mentalistic interpretations. But then if you go to footnote one, it says, we strongly suspect that the number of physicists who in fact genuinely adhere to either of these interpretations is considerably less than the number who claim to. <laughs> and actually that gets to the heart of it, because uh, what this is looking at is, is what seems like um, almost a, 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 an intellectual inconsistency between the quantum theory, which has been so exquisitely tested, probably to more decimal places than any other theory ever devised by the human mind, and the very classical experience of our us-sized lives. And 20 years after that paper, uh, you put it like this, Tony, in science, that you divided uh, reactions to the measurement problem for those who re you know, recognize that there is a measurement problem, which is not everybody, of course, uh, three broad, broad cl classes of response. Quantum mechanics is the complete truth and describes an external reality. Quantum mechanics is the complete truth and does not describe an external reality. Or quantum mechanics is not the complete truth and at some scale something different comes into play. <coughs> and I love this <coughs> summary later on in the paper. If I could be sure that we will forever regard quantum mechanics as the whole truth about the physical world, then I think I should grit my teeth and plump for option B, but making it clear that you don't find that very satisfactory either. In 2009, uh, I was in Santa Barbara. I was coming to the end of running the UK national uh, program at that time in uh, uh, quantum information processing. And uh, I spent uh, three weeks, and Daniel Loss, who's sitting there, uh, brought to my attention the paper about is the flux there when nobody looks. And uh, that sparked off uh, an idea. For, for, for 25 centuries, I should say, it's so uh, for, for a quarter of a century, it, 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 it was so difficult to see how to satisfy all the requirements of the test 
that there was scarcely any theory, uh, experimental implementations, one or two, but not many. And the requirements are as follows, that um, you're trying to devise an experiment that would rule out the conjunction of the following two postulates. First, that the system is always in one of its available states. And second, that it's possible in principle to determine the state of the system without altering its evolution. And if for simplicity we consider a two-level system and let the value of one level be plus one and the value of the other level be minus one, and then you uh, do the correlations between, well, it can be measurements at four times, but it works with three times as well, correlations between the three different pairs of measurements, and write down uh, an expression which could be in this form here, then uh, a few moments thought will quickly show that if those postulates hold, then uh, that function can never be non, uh, 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 can never be negative. And uh, the, the way that um, uh, when I came back to Oxford, we thought of doing this was in a condensed matter system where the system would be the nucleus of a phosphorus impurity atom in silicon. And uh, we first had, I first had the privilege of being able to talk to you the following year in Waterloo. And uh, I remember us discussing whether or not it was possible to do a test that didn't involve an ancilla. And uh, we did need an ancilla for this experiment and the, the system was the uh, nuclear spin and the ancilla was the electron spin associated with the impurity atom. And the non-invasive measurement was to do a controlled knot operation between those two. So the pulse sequence, once you see how you're going to do it, is actually rather simple. There was a complication. <clears throat> you're going to say, if we do a controlled knot operation and the ancilla does not change, then we're going to say there was no interaction. And that's okay, provided you'd fully initialized it. But of course, at finite temperature and magnetic field, you haven't fully initialized it, and we had to have a way of coping with that. Uh, uh, and we did the experiment, and the answer was that we found that this function was um, minus 2.96 with a 99% fidelity. So we had ruled out the possibility in that experiment of a macroscopic interpretation of realism. And I found it rather exciting that it was actually possible in the laboratory to do experiments that would answer a question in philosophy, at least rule out uh, one candidate philosophical interpretation. Well, it's become um, a very detailed story. There have been many other uh, tests of it. We did a subsequent one. When, when I showed you these results, you said, did you check that the system really didn't change after you'd done the non-invasive measurement? And to our embarrassment, we hadn't fully satisfied you on that point. So we then did a later one with um, a three-level system instead of a two-level system, implementing, uh, uh, well, it was a three-box problem that Yakia Aharonov had formulated. And uh, there it was indeed possible to check that the measurement was, it really was non-invasive. It wasn't changing the system. And if you... Um, if you assumed a sort of worst case scenario on the ones that weren't measured, then it was uh, a 7.8 sigma violation. Actually, if you made a fair sampling uh, assumption, then that rose to an 11.3 uh, sigma violation. And since then, there have been other experiments, including one that you yourself have been involved in, because um, four years after his first paper as a PhD student, George Nee then um, thought of other cleverer ways of doing it, in particular, a way of doing it as you'd originally envisaged with flux qubits. And I think uh, that in those experiments, you had co coherent superpositions of 170 nanoamps over a 10 nanosecond time scale. So um, at least in those situations, one's able to rule out this uh, uh, macroscopic realism interpretation. And when we talked about this in 2010, we thought, well, physics is full of surprises. We don't know what will come out of it. We'll, we'll have to see what happens. I think both of us had a pretty high expectation that quantum mechanics would be indeed vindicated. So where might one look 
for uh, where uh, quantum mechanics as we now have it might not happen and might solve the measurement problem. And there have been a number of um, continuous spontaneous localization models that have been put forward. I suppose the first and best known one is GRW. Uh, we looked at a slightly later version that was developed by Philip Pearl. And uh, we asked the question, could you, in a feasible experiment, do a test that would detect continuous spontaneous localization? I suppose the direct way to do it would be to look for a collapse of the wave function spontaneously. Uh, that's rather uh, hard to think how you do it experimentally. So Phil Pearl had suggested an indirect approach, which was that if CSL happens, there would be a heating effect, which you could predict. And uh, the energy raising rate, or the, the, the heating rate, is given by this equation here. And there are various parameters in the equation, um, some of which are under the experimentalist control. Uh, these two parameters here are well, <laughs> they're, they're, they're a reciprocal time scale and a length scale. To be honest, nobody's got any idea what those parameters would be, except that you can put a range on them, because um, if they were outside that range, uh, on the one hand, we would already have seen the effect, or on the other hand, it wouldn't make any difference within the lifetime of the universe. What we tried to do was to say, could we do this experiment using the best iron trap, but instead of having a, a, a single iron in the trap, have a larger object whose size we could choose? And if we did that, how hard would we have to work in order to uh, ensure that any other heating effects would be smaller than the one that we were looking for? And we, we thought of about six candidate uh, sources of heating effects. And to cut a long story short, the second group of three, we thought those are going to be so tiny that we don't need to worry about them at all. But the first three, we do need to worry about, and we need to calculate those very carefully. So for the mechanical vibrations, uh, we took real data, including data from the LIGO experiment, because however expensive it is, we know that that actually can be achieved. The electrical field noise is something that people who develop iron traps for technologies work very, very hard at, so we know how good they can get that, how low they can get the field noise. And the background gas collisions, and actually not only uh, collisions, but, but also molecules passing nearby, uh, is, a f uh, is a function of pressure. And so you can think, well, how hard do you have to work to get what sort of pressure in your vacuum system? And uh, the, the result of this was using the best best foreseeable or achieved uh, experimental conditions, we thought that we could um, detect the heating effect because of the continuous spontaneous localization if it was more than 1.6 times 10 to the minus 33 watts. And to turn that into actual uh, experiments, you know, using osmium, which is the densest material we can think of, and an optimum size of the object and shape of the object and uh, size of the iron trap. It boiled down to the question, uh, can you detect a temperature rise of 10 nanokelvins in a minute and a half, or equivalently 100 nanokelvin in a quarter of an hour? And uh, that exceeds any kind of sensitivity that has actually been achieved in a laboratory. But it doesn't exceed it by an impossible amount. And so, uh, you know, if one really wanted to do this experiment, I think it would be possible to do it if you work very hard at it uh, for long enough. Of course, we don't know whether those values of lambda and RC are correct values. So the likely outcome of the experiment would either be to detect continuous spontaneous localization or to um, put more severe constraints on the values that those parameters could have. The advances that are taking place in laboratory scale nanoscience are such that actually quite a lot of other foundational experiments are also coming within reach. Uh, there's been great progress in um, answering the question, uh, how does electricity flow through a single molecule? And it's now possible to measure that, and you can engineer molecules 
that would show significant quantum effects, uh, quantum interference, uh, Fano resonances, and uh, look for those in the measurement of electricity through the molecule. Here's one such experiment, and in this particular experiment, what was found was um, the effect of vibrational modes on the transport of electricity through the molecule. The molecule was a, um, a C60 molecule, a fullerene molecule, with sort of uh, molecular sticky notes to attach it to two sides of a nanogap in graphene. Here's an MD-DFT uh, calculation which shows one of the vibrational modes. This is a very common way of presenting the data in such experiments. So the vertical axis here is the source drain voltage, or sometimes called the bias voltage. And the horizontal axis here, it's not shown in the cartoon, but it's a, um, it's a gate voltage, so you can change the potential of the uh, molecule. And if you do that experiment where you just have a teensy-weensy capacitor, where there's no quantization except the quantization of the electric charge, then you get what are known as Coulomb diamonds in these stability diagrams. And the Coulomb diamonds uh, kiss each other, so they form a sort of X shape like that. These diagrams are rich in information. So you can see uh, that there is a sort of Coulomb diamond here uh, and there. Uh, the structure within it, which corresponds to known other kinds of vibrational modes of the um, fullerene molecule. And there's also actually a gap that's opened up. So instead of the forming an X shape, they've pulled apart slightly. And that's due to the kind of vibrational mode probably that we're seeing in the, uh, in the simulation there. And it, it's a version of a Frank Condon blockade where the displacement of the molecule in response to a charge is greater than the spatial extent of the, uh, of the position uh, of uh, wave function. In this experiment, you had to infer the motion of the molecule. You couldn't observe it directly. But with other uh, experimental systems, it is actually possible to make direct measurements of the uh, displacement of the vibrating object. So this is a, an actual device. It's got a single-walled carbon nanotube in it here. And uh, by putting this in a cavity, it's possible to detect the motion of the nanotube with exquisite precision. So uh, the cavity can be a 3D cavity like we were seeing in the last talk. Or in this particular case, it's a, it's a lumped element uh, cavity resonator capacitively coupled to the uh, nanotube. Uh, here's the person, Natalia Ares, who does the experiments and, in fact, has a lot of the best ideas. And they're done in a dilution fridge at 20 nanokelvin, uh, 20, I beg your pardon, millikelvin or less. And um, the, 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 uh, the new step that Natalia took with Edward Laird to get this level of sensitivity was to make the cavity resonant frequency close to the mechanical resonant frequency of the nanotube. And that gives a much, much greater sensitivity. And these are the kind of data that can be obtained. So this is another, uh, 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 this is a case where this is the, the voltage of a gate. So this, this electrode here. And this is the frequency. And then this is a display of, uh, well, it's the S13 of the uh, cavity measured with a vector network analyzer. And each of these corresponds to one electron going onto the nanotube. And you see, I find this absolutely amazing. You're actually sensitive to the change in frequency of the nanotube as the electron goes through a bright Wigner resonance. It's as if you're actually measuring the elastic stiffness of the wave function of one electron. And when it comes to looking at uh, quantum phenomena, systems like this are very significant advances on others because of the lightness of the nanotube and the high frequency that you get. So here's a little sketch of the zero-point quantum motion of different resonators that people have done experiments on. And with the nanotube, you're, you're getting close to a one picometer uh, displacement. 
And the uh, measurement sensitivity that's being achieved there is measured in femtometers per root hertz. So uh, in the experiments running at the lab at the minute, it's, 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 um, it, it's uh, uh, running at about, um, uh, well, a, a standard uh, quantum limit corresponding to a Fox state of about five phonons in the nanotube. And it's getting better as time goes by. It, it, it's rather remarkable that the technique here is in principle, the details are different, of course, in principle, it's the same technique that was used to achieve the extraordinary sensitivity required for the LIGO experiment. So uh, what sort of things might you be able to look at with this? Or to put the question another way, where else might we look for quantum theory as we now know it to break down. And uh, a very obvious place to look has already been mentioned today, and there'll be a whole talk on it um, tomorrow from Phil Stamp, is in uh, the relationship between quantum theory and gravity. And uh, the, 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 the surprise for me in the last few years has been this, that normally you think if you're going to do anything that involves gravity, it's got to be big because gravity is such a weak effect that you're going to need big things in order to be able to detect gravity. The surprise is that if you get small enough and close enough, you might be able to uh, detect or look for quantum gravity effects in nanoscale systems at very low temperatures. And by very low, I mean millikelvin temperatures. So um, there have been a number of um, uh, proposals uh, around for detecting uh, the difference between classical and quantum gravity. Again, I think Phil will uh, say more about these tomorrow. But one of them is that you take two uh, massive objects and you let them fall and you have a sort of chicane system so that they come together and then they go apart again. And if the gravitational interaction is quantum, then it ought to be able to create entanglement, which you ought to be able to detect in principle, however difficult that might be in, in practice. But now, taking a leaf out of um, uh, Phil Pearl's idea of looking for continuous spontaneous localization by the indirect effect of the heating, uh, Gerard Milburn and others have come up with ideas for looking for the difference between quantum and classical gravity through heating. And the basic idea is illustrated there. If we've got two objects and the interaction between them is quantum, then it's a closed quantum system and there won't be any heating, at least if CSL doesn't apply. But now, if uh, the interaction between them is classical, then that could cause a heating effect, which can be considered in information theoretic terms. So we think of, um, uh, say, this object here, distorting space-time, and that distortion of space-time travels as, let's say, classical information to this object here, which is then making repeated measurements of the position of this one. And those repeated measurements should give a heating effect. Now, the, 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 we thought of various ways that we could do this with two uh, membranes very close to each other, and they'd have to be large, thin, a large area, thin membranes, uh, very accurately spaced, very close to each other. And the challenges in doing that experimentally are formidable until we realize that actually um, you don't need two membranes, you only need one. So this is the sort of experimental setup uh, that runs routinely in the lab now for, for other purposes. And if the one membrane is crystalline, then you can think of uh, each nucleus in that crystal sampling the position of neighboring crystals. So you now you only need one. And the sum turns out to be rather easy to do because uh, we're going to assume it's a perfect crystal and therefore either they're all the same atom or it's a regular distribution of atoms. And the interaction falls over as 1 over r to the 6 for the same reason that you get a 1 over r to the 6 in the van der Waals interaction. And therefore, you don't have to sum for very far. And without going through all the maths, the conclusion is an equation which, uh, <laughs> which has both H bar and capital G in the same equation. I love this. 
S is a geometrical factor somewhere between 1 and 10, so let's take it as 1. Uh, mu is density, and this gives you uh, an energy raising rate, the heating rate. And we put the numbers in for the membranes that we have in the lab there, and it's going to be uh, about 10 to the minus 41 watts, which we're not going to measure. So the conclusion of that would be to say, not a hope, except that that's the minimum uh, energy raising rate, and it depends crucially on the strength and frequency with which each nucleus is, as it were, measuring the position of the other ones. And if that gets very strong, then you get a bigger effect. And if it gets very weak, you also get a bigger effect because then classical fluctuations take over. So uh, that's the minimum number. Who knows? The actual number might be much bigger because we've got this gamma naught that we really don't know what value it should have. Now, where else might you look for uh, the new advances building on the sort of theories that are coming out in the last uh, 10 years or so? And before I show you the next slide, I'm going to ask you another question. It's a who said question. So I want you to put your hand up if you know who said this. Schrodinger's wave mechanics is not a physical theory, but a dodge, and a very good dodge, too. Anybody recognize that? Do you know? That was Sir Arthur Eddington. He also said, and this is relevant for what I'm going to uh, finish up with, uh, he also said of thermodynamics, the law that entropy always increases holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it's found to be contradicted by observation, well, those experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. <laughs> but there are some exciting advances coming along in thermodynamics. As you move down to the small scale, uh, well, we've known for a very long time that uh, there's a relationship between information and thermodynamics, with one bit being uh, equivalent to kT log 2. And that was prompted by Maxwell's um, Beeman uh, uh, thought experiment, but of course it's been uh, developed by Zillard and Landau. And people are beginning to implement that now in nanoscale systems. Uh, Chris Rosinski and others have shown that uh, as you get very small, the fluctuations that on a big system with an Avogadro number of particles would just smooth out, the fluctuations now be, become significant. And, and um, curious enough, at least it was a surprise to me when I first started to get my head around it, that can turn uh, the inequality of the second law of thermodynamics into an equality, at least an equality of averages. Uh, and it therefore raises very foundational questions about the arrow of time. And then um, uh, it, people are only just beginning now to extend these to the uh, uh, quantum regime. Um, in, in quantum, both in quantum technologies and in quantum foundations, we need to know how a quantum system thermalizes. We've known about entanglement for so long but we know so little about the thermodynamics. And there are really foundational questions like, um, you know, it, 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 does this erasure apply also to quantum theory? Uh, if you're talking about work, what is work in a closed quantum system? And uh, as these uh, quantum effects become significant, so I think there are going to be a whole lot of questions in the quantum non-equilibrium thermodynamics that can be experimentally accessible. So uh, here's, here's uh, the sort of picture. If you think of traditional thermodynamics, which was devised, of course, to, to address questions like how efficient can a steam engine be, uh, you can think of it as having uh, the work, and I'm, I'm going to reverse the signs here and let this be a battery that can do work on the system. So it's like your air conditioning system. And then we have a calorific fluid which can generate heat, which can be dumped into a heat bath. And 
the key thing is that this part of it is deterministic and therefore reversible, and this part of it has a randomization and is therefore irreversible in the macroscopic large-scale system. Now, what happens when we get small? So now um, we're going to move to a system which might look like this. It might be our vibrating nanotube. And uh, we've now got, instead of uh, a continuous system, let's say just a two-level system. And there are various ways to implement a two-level system in a nanotube. Um, it could be electron spin up or down, or it could be an electron here or there, or it could be an electron present or absent. And uh, the battery now is the mechanical motion, and the electromagnetic reservoir is whatever this is coupled to at the electrodes at the end. And then uh, we've got a meter, which can uh, measure whether there's an electron there or not, and we can also, as I've shown you, measure the energy that's in the battery. And so we were asked to be forward-looking, and this is forward-looking because these experiments uh, are still to be done. I hope that in your 90th birthday party, I'll be able to tell you some of the results of them, but so will others because uh, there are many laboratories around the world that are now uh, beginning to be able to do experiments of this kind. They really are coming within reach. So let me um, draw to a close and go back to the title. Is the reality there when nobody looks? And these are really foundational questions. Questions like, um, why do we care about reality? Uh, is mathematics reality, as um, Max Tegmark thinks it is, drawing on, of course, uh, what Plato said about uh, the arche being number. Um, uh, Arthur Eddington, again, is mind the starting point of our experience? And, and uh, you know, at a really foundational level, I mean, let me make it very personal, is my life? Uh, in harmony with reality. Well, in 1959, um, Eugene Wegner gave a lecture on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Uh, he used the word miracle eight times in, that, uh, in the written version of the lecture anyway, and he ended up like this. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend to wider branches of learning. And I'd like to say the same about our curiosity about reality. The miracle of the appropriateness of curiosity for discovering the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend to wide branches of learning. And so what I'd like to do is to give you, as a birthday present, a copy of my book with Roger Wagner on curiosity. Happy birthday, Tony. Thank you. <laughs> there's a card that goes with it. Well, we were, we were talking about this earlier, Phil. I think that the best way to do that question is to look at it offline and go through the maths with you. Is there one other question that I'd be happy to answer now? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I don't think anybody has detected it so far, and I confess we've mainly concentrated on what might be possible in laboratory-scale experiments.
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's please thank Andrew again. <laughs> okay, yeah. Does that work? Yep, perfect. Okay, so I'm very happy to introduce Ray Laflamme. We've gone back a long time, coming to close out the day, telling us about Tony's influence on things in things Canadian. Thanks, Ray. Oh, first, happy birthday, uh, Tony. And I would like to thank the organizers, in particular Dale, to invite me to come and talk about the influence of Tony on uh, the informa quantum information science in um, in Canada. Um, yeah, it's the uh, calibration doesn't work. So unless, unless you don't like to see Tony with the pink in the background, then I'll keep on that way, especially the amount of time to fiddle through this. Um, and I like it like this. It makes it a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to be brief. And I <laughs> That's it. We can change my. I can change my glasses. It'll be uh, different. Um, I'll make some comments about the influence of Tony. We've heard a lot about him about the science today, a little bit as a colleague this morning, and I'll make remark about him as a mentor and an advisor because the quantum information science in Canada would not be what it is today without him. Um, he's helped us, giving a direction to it, hiring people, bringing people to Canada. So. Absolutely uh, wonderful. And by putting things together, I've asked uh, many of my colleagues to get stories about Tony. And so I'll mention a few of them. And what I've learned is that Tony has many talents. And um, from many different places, and the impact that he's had, it's not only in the, the, the quantum information community, but also on staff of the institute where he has come and visit, and also the general public. I was on my way here. I use usually the same car, uh, the driver, the, the car uh, company to bring me to the airport from Waterloo. The driver comes in and he asks me where, where I was going and I said to Illinois, he says, what are you going to do there? Are you giving a talk? I said, yeah, it's Tony Leggett's uh, 80th birthday. And so he says, oh, Sir Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you've met him? He says, oh yeah, I drove him a couple of times. So he said, oh, what a gentleman, what a humble man. It was, I never, well, the first time I drove him, I had no idea it was a Nobel Prize, and so only after I realized that I had to drive very carefully. So I said, do you have any good story about Tony? He said, yeah, I have one. One, one of the very few, first time he went to pick him up, he's, he's waiting for this guy to come up, and he has a list, and suddenly this guy comes in, Tony, with a black shoe and a brown shoe. <laughs> he says that was memorable. I've not seen many of those. A month after leaving Waterloo, then he came back, and then Tony still had the brown and the black shoe on to go back to come back here to um, to uh, Illinois. Um, People mentioned the influence of Tony, and I should say that he has changed a good part of my life through his science. So. Uh, in 1994, I went to a conference in Santa Fe on the physics of information, where it was the first time that I really kind of thought about quantum computers. And so there was this algorithm from this guy called Peter Shore to factor numbers, and there was a real buzz in the conference. And I had learned a little bit about decorrence through the Caldera Leggett paper. And so I came back to Los Alamos and I said, this quantum computing things will never work because of decorrence. And so I wrote a little paper trying to show this, and I got scooped on the internet. Somebody called Bill Unruh from Vancouver wrote something, and Bill had been my PhD supervisor, uh, my, sorry, my postdoc supervisor, and Bill loves to argue, tell him black, he say white, and he wants to say white, to say black. So when I saw his paper, I kind of wanted to shoot him down just to use his technique, and through this, I stumbled into quantum error correction and then learned more about quantum computing. Um, 
But then I had very little interaction with uh, Tony until I came back to Canada in 2001. And I was recruited both by the Parameter Institute and the University of Waterloo and kind of uh, got involved with an institute in Canada called the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And Tony has played a role on all of them. And those one I, I know a little bit more than others, so I'll talk about his influence there. So Tony was, um, he was uh, a scientific advisor at the Parameter Institute for 2004, 2008. And when I asked people what was his kind of main influence or the things they remember, he really, and one of them was that he really promoted a group on the foundations of quantum mechanics at the Parameter Institute. Anybody who works on the foundation of quantum mechanics knows that the rest of the community has a love-hate relationship with that field because sometimes it gets embroiled in words and fight about words where it goes very differently. And this is something that Tony has really helped that field by being very precise with the words that he's using and also um, proposing experiments that test certain hypotheses and ideas which doesn't always happen with the foundation of quantum mechanics. And also, the Perimeter Institute did not have a condensed matter group at, at the time. And really, Tony kind of planted the seed to make this happen. And of course, uh, Tony gave lectures, seminars, interviewed, and had impacts faculty and students over there. Second place where uh, I got involved with Tony on kind of uh, mentoring and putting, bringing people together is the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. This is an institute without a roof. It brings it built network of uh, people working on different areas of science, which they believe is promising for the future and for Canada. And uh, they have 14 programs. It's a really broad institute. Some programs are on human health, uh, building strong societies, sustaining the earth. And they have program, a couple of programs in physics, one in gravity, one in kind of uh, quantum matter, and one in quantum information science. And Tony got involved in there. And uh, it's a program, the, the program we have is made of two groups of people, computer scientists and physicists. And the fun thing in that program is to see the clash of language between the two and try to understand the different parts. And Tony was always helpful and patient when, kind of, even when at some lecture, uh, at some meeting, we had to have a lecture on what is the quantum uh, harmonic oscillator and the fact that there was infinities that appear sometime around there, we didn't have to worry, which um, computer scientists and the management had to worry about. Uh, the program meets twice a year at different location across Canada, and then kind of we discuss for a couple of days, and then we go, and uh, it's a col collaboration. One of the first meetings where I met uh, Tony was one a little bit north of Montreal, and it was on the weekend of the 18th of October, 2003. And many people here will understand why kind of I mentioned that date. That was a week after that Tony received his Nobel Prize. So us who had organized the program realized that Tony will never show up because he would be so busy replying for his email and kind of engagement here and there. But no, he showed up. He gave his talk. And what a wonderful example of a humble man and really kind of show to people what is important to discussion of science in different places. I have another story about the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, different places where we've been. One place is in Whitehorse in the Yukon. We decided to have a program there. And the idea was that it's isolated enough that people are stuck together and they will re really have to talk to each other. So if you want to go to, uh, in fact, the, the meeting was not in Whitehorse, but a place called Inge Junction, about an hour and a half drive from Whitehorse. So you fly to Whitehorse, then you drive to Ain Junction, and then there's a beautiful scenery with mountains around. It's just kind of near what is called the St. Elias Mountains, and uh, with, to which Mount Logan, the highest mountain in Canada, belongs to. And I know many people thought it was a totally crazy place to go to. It was a total magic moment of, of an incredible conference. I flew to Whitehorse a few days earlier and decided that I would go hiking. So I flew to Whitehorse, and I'd been there the year before, and there's a little restaurant where you have muskox stew. So I said, oh, I'll go and do this. And I arrived there, and Tony was there. So that was a bit of a surprise. I didn't know what was the schedule. So I told him, he says, oh, I'm looking for a lift to go to Inge Junction. So I said, okay, I will go, um, I will go with you. 
uh, I'll bring you in my car. So we go in the car and I tell him I was going to go hiking and I didn't know at the time that Tony really liked hiking. So he said, okay, I'll go with you. And so we chatted more and more and then we arrive at the, uh, at the Borderville town. So Ains Junction population is 600. So it's usually not very crowded, but we are up there. And so we see this sign, kind of, you are in bear country. So Tony asked me, are we gonna see any bear? I said, nah, like they say, they say this to scare the tourists, but uh, there's no problem. I was here with my kids camping last summer and just, we just saw a couple of bears one night on a road, but there was no problem. So he said, okay. But I said, before going hiking, we have to go to the, uh, the warden's little house and go and look at a movie about what to do if we encounter bear. So the movie or the video is about uh, 20 minutes and at the beginning they say, stay away, kind of uh, don't make br uh, brusque movement and back up and make yourself big. And so it goes like this and it's very tame or he, he, they come and charge you, kind of stay your ground and kind of if they are coming fast and you see a tree, try to climb the tree. And the last kind of 30 seconds of the video is, uh, if there is a grizzly who attacks you and is mauling you, then you have to fight for your life. <laughs> so we get out of there and Tony says to me, are we gonna see any bears? And then he tells me his daughter had asked him if he was going to see any bear. And I said, no, you don't have to worry. We're not gonna see any bear. So we get out of town. <laughs> we do about five kilometers. What do we see on the side of the road? There is this bear. It's about kind of a few hundred feet. So we stop with the car and then we look and they say, oh, Tommy, you wanted to see a bear? There you are. You are. And so we look at it for a few seconds and I turn back to take my binoculars and while I do this, my left elbow hits the, the hunk and so the bear disappears and suddenly this big gray wolf shows up and so there must have been a kill. And then uh, I said, Tony, this is very special. Not only you've seen a bear, bear, but you've seen the gray wolf that comes with it. So we keep on going and then we go to this lake which is up there where um, there is uh, a trail that goes up this mountain. I was interested to go and, and see because there are special mountain sheep who are there. So I said that to, to, to Tony and said, okay, it's a very good idea. But you can read very well, and this is something that I had not read the map that well at the time. The blue is uh, reserved for grizzlies around here and also this little spot up there. So I said, well, good. so I didn't know at the time and we go there and so no problem. We arrive at the, the, the station. People, oh, people says, okay, you go hiking there. Should be back in five or six hours. And we come back. And then you're kind of, as Tony started hiking, so we go up. We go up, kind of up to the trees. Kind of go out beyond the trees and go up and things. And then suddenly we arrive, kind of a little plateau there. In fact, this is a picture I found on the internet. We were really at the bottom there. And then we stop there for a little break. And what do we see at some point? I don't see very well, I have glasses, but movement I can spot very much. It's maybe the, the in hunter instinct in me that kind of goes. And there's this bear kind of just moving up there, but it's kind of probably a mile away. So I said, you know, we okay, we can go. So we keep on hiking. We go there to the end of the trail, we come back. And then we decide to have lunch. Ah, oh, what did I bring for lunch? Smoked salmon. <laughs> <laughs> so we opened the smoked salmon and it was a chunk of smoked salmon so we were cutting it our hands are kind of full of smoked salmon and uh, we're far from civilization so you clean your hands on your hands and then we keep eating and then suddenly I look again in the mountain and now there's two grizzly bear <laughs> uh, a big one and a small one so I have my mother and a pop and they are going this way and then we're coming back for our trail and we're going to go this way too so then I start to worry a little bit because they were going down and we we're going to go there and I said, we might intersect. So we pack up all our stuff, we go down and then we go back in the forest and then we kind of say, okay, we should be fine now. We go back, take the smoked salmon out again, start eating and all this. And suddenly a group of people started to go up the, the, the trail and when they saw us, because we had started to move a little bit, they got really scared. And so we said, oh, you guys look a little bit nervous. They said, yeah, it was this grizzly bear coming down in the gully just behind you. We had never heard, it. we had not heard about them at all, <laughs> but there it was. So the thing that I learned there is a couple of things. First is that 
Tony is a bear attractor. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is that when we were at the top there, I thought that I was a little bit younger than Tony and that if the bears was really coming, I was going to be able to work faster or run faster than him. But then I realized that Tony, although he was a few years older than me, was definitely running or kind of walking as fast as me on the way down. So he was in good shape and, and kind of, he was not going to be left behind. And then I was thinking, what would happen if on the way down, suddenly we would see in the newspaper kind of Nobel Prize winner eaten by a bear <laughs> at a conference. <laughs> So the people, the CIFAR people were not too keen on me when I came back and told them the story, but after a time they thought it was a little bit funny. Now, I saw that recently all the area where I want is closed because of bear movements. And then, so Tony, we've been once, but I'm not sure that we would go again a second time together in that, that area. <laughs> okay, so I last uh, places where Tony that I know very well where Tony has had an impact is the Institute for Quantum Computing. So Tony was uh, a research chair and a vis visitor for 10 years between 2006 to 2016. And during that time, Tony kind of did science at ITC. And thank you for uh, the department here, the physics and NLRI to have shared Tony and allowed him to come and visit us on this time. The institute was just kind of starting, kind of building up, and the advice of Tony was really precious. Tony gave public lecture, he gave scientific talk, he uh, helped in the 50th anniversary of the university, gave a presentation, and you can see the famous person here, Tony, when we had other visitors around. But what surprised me, Tony had zero obligation except of coming and visiting us for a period of time during the year. But every year, he gave a talk to grad students. And here's the list of all of them again. And if you're interested, you can find a copy of them at YouTube. So we recorded all of them during the years. And about a, a month ago, I was with a bunch of students and postdocs at T at the Institute, and people started to talk about weak measurement. And one of the students said, hey, if you really want to learn about what weak measurement are, are go to lecture number six of Tony in 2011, and then you'll really learn what they are. And indeed, I went to look at it, and excellent presentation on weak measurement. So another testimony of Tony's impact. A week ago, there was a talk by a postdoc at IQC, and the first slide was a picture of Tony, and on, uh, on one of the book, who talks about broken symmetry. So, the, the, the postdoc says that I had a number of co conceptual questions about spontaneously broken gauge symmetry. And then he did this PhD in, in, in Korea, and so he was on his own, he came to IQC, and then suddenly he saw Tony, interacted with him, and then suddenly he said uh, that uh, Prof Leggett at the, Cor so that the time was one of the happiest time of his, as a researcher, his interaction with Tony, and then he thought that Tony had the courage of challenging established dogma and pushing the boundary of science, which I thought is one of the many comments that I had related to, to Tony. Okay, um, a little bit of science. We've heard about the Gar-Leggett inequality, and we've seen this part of this morning in part with uh, Andy, and I thought Erfan was going to mention it. He kind of mentioned it at a high level, but when it was time to do it experiments, we haven't heard about it yet. The, uh, the, so we're hoping in the come, next coming of years, we'll hear, hear more about it. I got interested in this, not the way that Tony would be interested in kind of distinguishing uh, and trying to see a macroscopic quantum coherence, but maybe as a thing about thinking about quantum computers. Of are they behaving classically in certain case or quantum mechanically? And in particular, in the case of uh, liquid state NMR. So I do some experiments with liquid state. We do experiments at room temperature and in a system which is in a very highly mixed state. And there were debates when it was uh, uh, at Los Alamos. In fact, some with Paul 
and some Gerardo Ortiz would remember some of them, about is this quantum or not? And the answer that we had at the time was uh, this paper, Manik, Neil, and I, called The Power of One Qubit of Quantum Information. So we, and the idea is to have an algorithm which gives you an answer if your initial, in a quantum computer, when your initial state is incredibly mixed, which would be hard to find uh, classically. And the idea is the following, you start highly mixed state, and here the Z is the poly uh, sigma Z matrix, so for high temperature, we can simulate that, we can assume that the, the density matrix is well approximated by this, so we have one quantum bit, which has a little bit of polarization, all the other quantum bits are in totally mixed state, so it's a weaker system than NMR by itself. So, and then what we could show is that if we do a control unitary on this, what we find here is the real part of the trace of that unitary. And then typically, finding the trace of this unitary is something which is hard. So for a generic U, it is very hard. Even quantum computers will not be able to do this. But for U, which are a tensor, pro uh, a sum or, a, sorry, a product of one and two qubit gates, then this is still hard and we don't know how to do it. So we gave this as a challenge to the community. If you can do this efficiently on a classical computer, then you can say that NMR is behaving classically. In fact, if you can do this efficiently on a classical computer, chemists would love it. They would be able to find structure of a protein much more, more efficiently. And that's quite interesting because it goes to one question at the foundations of quantum computation, of where is the power of quantum computation coming from? Quite often, at the high level, people say entangled state is the answer. And here, we have, if there is entanglement, it's a very, very, very small amount, but still the power is there. So I got interested by this because this is a very computer science way of thinking about the classical and the quantum world, and there's, is there something which is kind of a little bit more physical? And these guard legate, or legate guard inequalities is an example of this, which is really kind of looking at does the system get into superposition as it evolves? So we've seen this already a little bit uh, today. My notation is slightly different than the one from uh, Andrew. So I have this k parameter, which is a sum and a subtraction of these correlation function. If you go and look, if you be classical, this k should be between minus three and one. But if you look at for certain state and say certain evolution in quantum mechanics, you can get a maximum of 1.5. So it was interesting to implement this. And to do something a little bit different, then we went to look at a spin uh, one system, three level, similar to what Andrew did. Uh, we looked at, uh, we want to do this and do the measure this correlation while we're ensuring that we don't have uh, a measurement which is invasive, so we made a test using these gates of showing this, and uh, what we did see is a violation of these equalities. Here we have a time tau, which is uh, the difference between the time T3 and T2 of the third and the second measurement, and as a function of this tau, the violation of this uh, uh, guard legate, legate guard inequality goes like this, the dots are the points of the measurements that we've done, you can see a violation here. So in that sense, that system is behaving quantum mechanically, although there is no entanglement in that system with that number of qubits in the liquid state. So interesting piece. Um, we were also interesting, interested in particular what happens to the error here. And so if you are taking all the error in the experiments, add them the worst thing possible, you would get up to that limit, which is about 1.4, and so the result that we had was a little bit more than that. Okay, so Paul has asked to do our talks five, to finish our talks five minutes earlier. I am nearly there, so I'm going to finish by, uh, thank you, Tony. Um, Tony asked to ask a question about the future, so m my question is, Maybe we can use the legate guard inequality, not only to test if the system is quantum or not, but looking as a test if your quantum com computer is doing the right things and has the ability of making superposition or not on the scales that become large. Our Irfan mentioned having quantum 
uh, devices with 10, 20, 50, or 100 qubits, until we arrive to the thousands of qubits, we'll not be able to use fault and error correction. So there'll be a place where we'll have to test if these devices are doing real quantum computation, or the noise will come in and make them free simulatable graphically. And possibly the legate guard and the could be a tool to be able to show this. So I'd like to finish by saying thank you to Tony. Thank you for your discoveries, sharing the, them with us, for pushing the boundary of science, for being a mentor and advisor, and for in, being an inspiration to all of us. And I have a card here from your friends and colleagues at the Institute for Quantum Computing. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.